process for the second consecutive year recipient of the Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards for Outstanding Talk Show Series and Outstanding Public Affairs Series. Major funding for due process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. the first year the NCAA's Proposition 16 took effect. The controversial eligibility rules for freshman athletes require a GPA of 2.5 and 13 core courses and a minimum 820 on the SAT. Trouble is, while you can have a lower grade point average and a higher test score, you can't have a higher grade point average and a lower test score. Even if your GPA is 4.0, 20 is the cutoff. Lower than that, you're out. The NCAA should not be involved in our setting standards. The university should act on it. The university should decide. I saw that thing and said, well, I'm getting my bachelor off. Blah, blah, blah. I saw that today. It's a thing. You're not going to get it. You're not responsible. While Joel made it onto the court, many others, particularly African Americans, have been left on the sidelines. So four students suited up for a different case. Their coach is attorney Andre Dennis. This suit will not challenge the year one core course requirement. It has challenged the SAT and the minimum requirement. And the basis of that challenge is that it is an arbitrary cutoff score that was selected by the NCAA. Without any empirical evidence that that score was necessary or appropriate, that by moving that score, it has an unreasonable and disparate impact on African-American student athletes in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. If you remove the motivation, if you remove away from the focus as to how this man looks, then just the fact that he is in this college, I believe he can never qualify for any of these courses. Therefore, they never get it. Division I includes over 300 major colleges and universities. David Rubin represents the NCAA. Scholarships, uh, freshmen, uh, a 
Students and educators at St. Benedict's Prep School in downtown York are living with the reality of Proposition 16. Julio Nasta is a senior with a 3.8 grade point average. When you think total yards, it shouldn't be like how long it should be since the second half of games. But you take it to part time and say, I shouldn't be getting the court time. I have to, I have my SAT right now. So it took me like from 5.9 to 6.8. Jarrell Wright scored an 860 on the SAT. He'll be attending Providence on a full basketball scholarship if he makes the grade. I think the kid is the the heart of this and it's for a college level game. So that's why the minimum standard has been put into place. Daniel wants to use that same hope this kid can play triple or even three. Absolutely. But what it did give us was that we can we can understand it's a father. But yes, he can play multiple three. So the problem was the education. For me, the issue was being able to go to college and have an opportunity to participate. And there are a lot of people who think that uh, um, when it's when sports in college should change to more of a professional nature. I think they're okay with taking the players and dancing with them. I think they're okay with the parents and the wife and everybody saying, I don't think they're real players. But at the University of Michigan, they have a lot of great youth entertainers. They can have very entertaining adults, alumni, and everything else on the weekends. Rutgers and elsewhere, many athletes are paid. They have full scholarships. In the men's and women's uh, basketball league, the Rutgers women have scholarship uh, players. But just the other team, the men's 85 scholarships and uh, 78 grants. Bob Mulcahy is athletic director at Rutgers University. While he has misgivings about the SAT, he still wants standards. And then if you don't have an SAT, then where are you going to have uh, an admission to a 13 or 12 places. Now, you may not have anything, the difficulty is that you will then have uh, different standards of grading in high schools. So this begins to demonstrate to you the complexity of trying to set a standard uh, for what, what's really fair to all involved. And that fairness to all is what Andre Dennis is after. On March 8th, Judge Ronald L. Buckwalter of the U.S. District Court in Philadelphia threw out the 820 test score minimum. The judge ruled that he was correct that Proposition 16 does have a disparate impact and that the disparate impact was an impact that the court found was unlawful because the NCAA had not validated by an outside testing source or outside source the cutoff score for what was imposed. Disparate impact, a legal term meaning that a standard or practice or test has a disproportionate effect on a protected minority. Third Circuit Court of Appeals granted the NCAA's motion for a stay in the case. Meanwhile, Proposition 16 is still in effect. Federal courts will decide whether the NCAA can devise a legally acceptable standard for college athletic eligibility. However, the policy issues surrounding the question of who should play are controversial and longstanding. We'll come back with the opinion of several experts in that to unravel these dilemmas. see yet and some of the language is a little too um i'm not going to say it's plain english but i mean it, it's just it's a little difficult to understand if you're not familiar with like different texts that were used in high school but you want to be creative you want to do something different let the kids sign a contract let the school sign a contract nobody's living until they're through at least two years of college 
I feel like there's some requirements for every school. If there was a requirement to put it together with an eight, 20, two college, it would get away. It would raise the talent. The question is, should the SAT carry the weight that it carries now for the trip? Academic performance, which happens over a long period of time, uh, is different than the ones on the SAT scale. From Sunday, Federal Sports and Special Entertainment, a federal partnership with Oral Roberts BNCAA's SAT-based Proposition 16 for fundamental civil rights laws proves a disproportionate effect to black student athletes. This ruling resurrects the long simmering questions of how college athletes can be protected from exploitation, who should be protected, and whether the SAT is a racially neutral test. To explain these issues, we are joined by Andre L. Dennis, one of the lawyers who just successfully challenged Prop 16 for student athletes. My sister, Dr. Deborah Bowles Brown Bowles, again with us on this case, Director of the Commissions for the Rutgers Campus, the Camden Campus of Rutgers University, and for your Elsa Kirsten Hall, General Counsel for the NCAA, want to welcome you all. Uh, let me start with you, Andre. Are you opposed to any minimum standards for athletic eligibility? No, I'm not opposed to any minimum standards. I think those standards have to be based upon empirical data. I also believe that colleges and universities themselves are best suited to set those standards. Different colleges and universities have different missions. And one of the problems with the NCAA setting a standard is that it utilizes a one-size-fits-all. That's not the way it should operate in real life. And uh, Ms. Cole, no one has ever suggested that the NCAA is looking to discriminate. On the other hand, there seems to be a broad, long-standing consensus that the SAT is going to produce when relied upon strongly uh, results that have a disproportionate racial impact. What's the NCAA's feeling about the disparate impact part of this package? Well, unfortunately, there seems to be a discrepancy between the scores that black student athletes receive versus white student athletes on these standardized tests. And no matter where you put a minimum test score requirement, that there are going to be a larger number of black students affected by it. However, there is no allegation in this lawsuit that the SAT is racially biased, and it's a question of whether it's a proper mechanism to try to determine who's going to be able to successfully graduate from college. The court agreed that the SAT was an appropriate tool to use in determining that, and there's no question that the combination of grades and SAT scores is the best predictor of who's going to graduate from college. So I think it's good that the court recognized the use of these scores and allowed us to continue to do to utilize them, but it, it's just something that we'll have to work with and that we've continued to work at for a long time and will continue to work at into the future. Well, putting aside the result of this current litigation, is the NCAA looking at changing the use of a minimum SAT score, which has a racially disparate impact, whatever the reason? Yes, it's been looking at that for some time. There was a vote even back in 1994 as to whether this rule should continue in the form that it is in presently. Uh, last summer, there were other models put forth to the membership. They wanted to see what was going to be happening with the current model, the current uh, Proposition 16, before they made any change. They wanted to see what the results were going to be with this one. But these are all still on the table, still under examination, and it's still possible that the NCA itself will continue to do the work and determine a new standard at some point. The, the reason I wanted to ask you about this is that my own impression from watching this trial, this case, issue of SAT scores is just one of the proxies for how they're going to determine freshman eligibility for their student athletes. In fact, this issue has been around a long time. Yes, um, it's been an issue for many years, particularly as it relates to students who traditionally have been underrepresented in higher education in this country. And there are two issues which have been related in general to the SAT use as well as uh, for the NCAA. One is cutoffs and minimums, which is not the way SAT scores are supposed to be viewed in fairness to students. And also, even College Board emphasized that SAT scores should be used as only one measure. And particularly when it relates to students of color, it is very important to look at a number of other measures as well. And although the NCAA may do that, they certainly seem to place disproportionate weight on the SAT score. Uh, many students of color, due to circumstances beyond their control, are excluded from many opportunities that would enhance their performance, particularly on the standardized test scores. Now, Mr. Dennis suggested that there's sort of a second prong of his concern, which is the question of whether it's the colleges or the NCAA that are setting the standards. As I know you're involved in a number of professional associations, are there debates about what role the admissions offices, as opposed to the NCAA, should play in setting standards? Absolutely. Uh, I am very active in the national as well as the state association, and each 
year at our conferences and throughout the year, we often discuss the role of the athletic programs in relationship to admissions. And I would say in general, college and universities, I think, do very thoughtful and careful work in determining who should be admitted to the universities. And I think, as Mr. Dennis pointed out, our admissions vary greatly. And some schools are in much better uh, places to help students who are not as well academically prepared. Again, due sometimes to the very nature of their high school experiences, which are beyond their control, it just happens to be the other thing in high school. Uh, I want to ask you in your own terms of response to what's called the ETA, the Crisis Management Initiative. How come this wasn't resolved by UTC in negotiating a change in the use of a E20 SAT exam? Well, I don't know that I can answer for the NCAA, but um, we certainly are willing to discuss a possible resolution of the case. Uh, it just didn't happen that way. I think at this point, the NCAA is probably more concerned about the course decision with respect to Title VI. It doesn't want to be Say that a little bit better, Dwayne. You mean the Civil Rights Act? The Civil Rights Act. Yeah. The, court, the court determined that the NCAA is subject to the reach of the Civil Rights Act. And one of the things I think that troubles the NCAA is that determination. The NCAA does not want to be bound by the Civil Rights Act. Um, we believe it is properly bound by that act. We believe that it's necessary as witnessed by the fact that the NCAA is not doing the right thing with Proposition 16. Ms. Cole, it's kind of unfair for us to be here and speculating about what the NCAA thinks when you're with us. Um, is, does the NCAA have other policy concerns about whether or not it should be subject to the Civil Rights Act that influence how it's handling this matter? Well, there were certainly some very significant rulings made by Judge Walter in his decision that the NCAA feels strongly about, and Mr. Dennis is correct in that the procedural basis for the lawsuit going forward is a great concern to the NCAA. We do not believe this particular Civil Rights Act should apply to us because we're not a recipient of federal funds, which is a prerequisite for that act to apply to us. However, the NCAA has voluntarily undertaken numerous programs to assist minorities and women and others to achieve uh, success in, in the athletic field. We offer scholarships and fellowships that are specially set aside for members of those particular groups. And we offer opportunities to serve on our various committees by setting aside seats for those individuals from the various campuses. I mean, we are very fully committed to diversity and gender equity within the association. Let me, let me ask you one thing. So let's assume that you were to win in the Court of Appeals. It wouldn't be the first time a circuit court reversed the district court. And you were in a position where the NCA could legally proceed as it saw fit. Um, would the racially disproportionate impact of the E-20 split, even though it's not the NCAA's doing, but is the result of an impact from the SATs that is yet to be resolved, would you be comfortable using a rule that has this impact? Well, as you know, of course, it's not just the impact of whether it's an unjustified impact that is illegal in a case like this. And the NCAA is very concerned that if there, since there is this, this apparent disparity in scores between these different groups of students, that we do feel that it would be justified. And that's one of the issues that we're continuing to examine it because that's of great concern to us. We want to give our black student athletes access to these scholarships and these programs, but we don't want to set them up to fail. So I'm not sure. So you would say that you could see a, see a set of circumstances in which you would continue with this rule if, in fact, you determined that it was justified, notwithstanding the disproportionate impact. Unfortunately, that's one possibility that exists, that uh, there would continue to be a disproportionate effect no matter where we put um, a line. Uh, I, I think that's uh, really not the issue because the fact that blacks on average score differently than whites on average on SATs is one thing. Where you draw the line is a completely different matter, and that has a, has a big effect on the impact on African Americans. Whether you weight the, NC, whether you weight the SAT at uh, one standard deviation than the mean uh, or two standard devi deviations than the mean, let me start drawing the statistics. You throw me what you're saying is how you affect where the cutoff is will have a, an effect on the NC. That, that, that's correct. Because the, the NCAA has a selection rule. One of the points we made in the litigation is that if you look at that selection 
you do, I think the drawing of the line is the issue. Uh, drawing a line to me suggests that you're looking at one measure and placing greater weight on it than you are others because without a line you're able to look at a student holistically and look at academic performance in high school, look at limitations based on the student's accessibility to advanced and honors courses within a high school program, look at the opportunities or lack thereof which a student has experienced from elementary school through to high school level in terms of opportunities in the schools and even I would say outside the schools in the particular neighborhoods. So I think unless you look at a student in terms of a number of factors which have affected that student and that student's performance, including standardized test scores, but most certainly also including high school performance, including extracurricular activities, including special talents, which certainly could include athletic ability, I think you're really going to disservice a proportionate number of students. And I think I have a particular sensitivity to it because it seems that whenever there's someone who's disservice, it tends to be students of color if they're viewed only in terms of one single measure. Ms. Cole, it seems in some ways the NCAA may be being criticized for doing something with the right motives. That is, for 10 years you've sounded a clarion call about the minimum standards, which everybody seems to agree should exist. But if flexibility is the key, why doesn't it make sense to devolve this responsibility back to the colleges, the admissions departments, and set, say to them, look, we expect you to maintain standards, and if we find anybody who's not enforcing standards, we'll use our other enforcement mechanisms. Why wouldn't that make more sense than setting standards that seem to have disproportionate impact, which are just visceral, this kind of stuff? Right. I want to clarify a couple of points for your viewers. I, I wouldn't want people to get the impression that the NCA is making admission decisions, because they're not. Those are left individually up to the colleges, and as you as the previous speaker said, they should be left up to the colleges. All the NCA is saying is you, if you want to play sports your first year and take on the rigors of that kind of schedule in a Division I school, we want to make sure that you have the academic preparation to take that along with the rigor pressures you're going to feel from your studies in order to eventually be successful and graduate from college. I also want to point out that the people that are making these decisions are the college and university presidents. It's not a staff sitting in Overland Park trying to decide who should and who should not be playing. It's the presidents and of these various colleges and universities in Division I who hopefully are working closely with their admissions officers so they're aware of exactly the problem you describe. And the, last, and the last sure, point, if I can, make sure. is that the NCA has a waiver process in place because we realize that you cannot have one standard that fits all and that there are individual circumstances that may create an exceptional situation that should be examined on an individual level and in fact we do review in a large number of cases each year and 50% of those that are reviewed receive a waiver and are allowed to go forward and play sports their first year and receive academic aid as well as additional athletic aid. So if you're shaking your head no I think you have 30 seconds left but how the waiver process is somewhat a loser when it comes to the SAT scores because the NCAA does not grant waivers when it comes to SAT scores with respect to domestic students. Maybe some international students should get a waiver but not domestic students. Uh, the other factor is that um, admissions officers do determine who should be admitted, but why should someone who is admitted be subject to another hurdle with respect to freshman competition? And that bears on athletic scholarships, and if you don't get the scholarship and you can't afford to go, you're excluded. Evidently, both of them, and both sides of this uh, also agree with regard to us that there was an impact on African Americans by using the SATs. Is that a continuing source of controversy? And should one of you folks that work for the college of Women and University of Texas be asked? That certainly has to be separate. In the last few seconds, is there a continuing effort to find out what this is about and to correct it when it is? Absolutely. And I think as we see a greater correlation between socioeconomic factors and performance on the SAT and look at where the students are coming from, in many cases students of color, there definitely seems to be a disproportionate impact. And I think also this does call on... Have to cut you off. Oh, oh as you do. Okay. Oh, I've never done this before in my life. No, Mrs. Durham, Ms. Cole, uh, Ms. Dim, thanks for being with us. That's it for this edition of New Process. But join us next week when our docket will have been moved out of the court and will all argue the same cases. Till then, for all of us at the New Process, I'm Randall Cole.
Funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.